Okay, welcome. This episode of Building Bulletproof Backs, I've got Muriel or Mumu, I like to call Mumu, it's much easier than your full name. Uh, Mumu and I crossed paths many years ago. Um, she was running a Pilates studio in Margaret River, where I live, and I happened to be walking past the studio one day and saw a for lease sign and on a whim went in and asked her what was going on. And um, anyway, long story short, we ended up working in the same space together. And I recall feeling very amazed by what she knew, uh, also inadequate <laughs> by what she knew, and also feeling quite blessed that I could observe and watch and learn from someone who knew a lot more about the fascial system than I had been exposed to. And um, yeah, I think we developed a mutual professional respect um, that has formed into a friendship. And I hardly ever see this lady now because she's <laughs> flitting around the world, sharing what she knows and teaching it on a world stage. But um, she's back in Margaret River and she gets to join me in my space. And um, I will let Mumu introduce herself to you all. Thank you. I feel equally blessed that our paths have crossed because um, I learned as much the other way around through manual therapy with you and having many good conversations going down rabbit holes. Yes. Um, so like Marion said, my name is Muriel, which most people find a tongue twist. Therefore, they call me Mumu. So you take your pick. Um, I grew up in the Swiss Alps and I pretty much learned skiing the same way I learned walking. I can't remember learning how to ski. From there, it went on into um, hiking, whitewater kayaking and dancing. Actually, dancing came way before whitewater kayaking. But as you can see, um, there was always a lot of movement in my life. I didn't take it for granted. It was just something we did as a family. I did um, as a person and I always, um, I always loved it. And um, Reflecting though, when Marion asked me of, um, to talk um, today, is I did take for granted that I'm just able, you know, I'm not specifically talented at dance or skiing or whitewater kayaking or all these things that I did, but I was very able, you know, as a, as a normal person, I was just very able at it and I took it for granted, that's for sure. And a very long story short, um, at 16, um, I jumped off a 50 meter cliff into water and I am scared of heights. So this was this big thing that made me scared of heights. I'm gonna prove it, I'm gonna do this. Um, so I did, but halfway down, going down, I just wanted to literally get out of my body. So by the time I did hit the water, I wasn't in the perfect position that you're supposed to be when you jump that far down. And my feet straight away gave away and it took all the pressure up my coccyx mm. and was paralyzed or numb for at least two to three minutes, just coming up being in extreme shock. You know, this one split second of, yeah, I overcame this. And the reality hitting in, I can't feel my legs. Mm. And my friend across on the rock, seeing my face, just going, what is wrong? I had a life jacket and everything. So I was fine, but I was super scared. So um, I think you say it in English as well. In, in German, you say that it sits within your bones. So actually it sits within your fascial system. Not saying it doesn't sit within your bones as well, but I didn't realize of how much that actually did take a hold mm. in my fascial memory. Mm. Um, so as a teenager, as you do, you know, you're in extreme pain for a week or so, you get over it um, and you just keep on going. And I didn't... I saw a physio for a few times and, you know, that sort of helped. And on I went and um, went a lot stronger, a lot more into dancing, didn't have any repercussions. Um, from there as a 17-year-old, I went and to the Nepal, um, to the Alps in Nepal, and I really, really tested my body in trekking up five and a half thousand meters and with carrying a backpack and stuff. And again, I just took my body for, you know, it was this thing that I moved and um and it was amazing of realizing on how capable i was even when i had 39 degree fever of you know what my body is capable of but i still didn't get it at the time i just really 
drove my body hard. And from there, I went into, um, I started training for dancing and um, eventually got into a dance school and a very holistic dance school in London. We had to do Pilates and yoga as well. We had to do Pilates and some, if we chose, we could also do yoga. What, what sort of dance out. was it? What, sorry? What sort it of was dance? contemporary dance. Okay, yeah. yeah. So we did have to do ballet, but it was contemporary dance. And we were fortunate that um, we had lab analysis, which some of it is more like, you know, you explore embryolic um, embryological Embry movement yeah that sounds good <laughs> In, into womb <laughs> movements yeah 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 and um so we had a, a massive array of different dance styles and different teachers so some very old school but some were 25 or 27 year old so they looked at movement in a much more holistic way um so i think uh, we were extremely fortunate and i do I am 100% convinced because I did parties three times a week. I never had an injury. At the time, I didn't know that, but I am a fascial temple dancer, which means my internal... Um, a fascial temple dancer. Yeah. So, I've never heard that term um, so either you're a temple dancer or a Viking. There's there are these two terms that are out there that Robert Schleif and Tom Myers, I think, <laughs> they just, you know, had this discussion and talked about it. And I think Tom wrote to net... Um, it's in the yoga journal. So he wrote an interview about it or something. So it's, if I would have known that earlier in my life, it would have changed my life. And I will get back to what that means, but, um, or I can tell you now what it means. It's in, in extremely simple terms. If we think of this, you know, this sweater, this is a little bit more temple dancers like sweater. So I have to, it doesn't have that much tension. It has some tension and it has some integrity, but it doesn't have as much um, tension as, for instance, a Viking's fascial has. It's a predisposition. They, okay. they suggest that you're born with a predisposition. I don't think it's proven yet. So uh, you're saying a predisposition in your fascial qualities. Yeah. Yeah. In your, it's like how, how tensile yeah, it okay. is by nature. Right, yes. The good news is you can train it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So um because I did, you know, Pilates focused quite a bit on stabilization as well. So as a temple dancer, you might have a little bit, I'm not hyper mobile, but I do have a bit of a laxity in that sense in within the tissue yeah. inherently. Yeah. So by doing that, it just kept me balanced and it kept me fine. But then from and from there, um, I also, you know, qualified as a Pilates instructor, like the most basic Pilates training that was out there. But and, I, and was that because you were enjoying the method or intellectually or because you enjoyed how it got, you made your body feel? What was the initial spark in this body of work called Pilates? Mm, it made me a lot more able as a dancer. Okay. And at the time I caught, because, you know, I wasn't taught to think for myself when I did that little course, more as in like I was just parroting. Yes. But what it did and um, the way certain things I was, I suddenly had more strengths in certain areas, not realizing that I, because it worked on ha having more dynamic stability. But right. At the time, I couldn't comprehend that. No. And um, so, yeah, that made a very big difference. And I think that's why I was drawn to it. Okay. Um, and um, and maybe because it had a very clear structure, I think at the time I would have been drawn to that as well. Got you, got you. Yeah, that's a good point that you make with, I only had that conversation with that previous client about, we were discussing the difference between Pilates and Feldenkrais. And on the spectrum, I see them as one end, diversely opposite in a lot of things, their philosophy, one's rigid, one's open-ended and curious, one's playful, one's doctrinated, not always, but we're generalizing. But I can see that at certain stages of our lives, one method will be where you're at. You know, you might need that rigidity and you might need to be told how to do a certain movement a certain way. That might just be where you're at. And then as you, pro I see progressing beyond that as having the confidence in your body to explore, to be playful, to be curious, but maybe you can never reach that curiosity of exploring your movements, you know, if you don't disable the fear of all directions, which is something that Pilates might bring to the table. It might help you get confidence into knowing 
you know, which, which directions actually feel safe and secure or, or not even exploring your directions, just finding centre and finding stability in one place in the middle. Mm. But I'm digressing. So go back to... Um, Can I just say one sentence to this? Yeah. And I've never, ever thought of it like that, but the contemporary dance and what we were explored and one of my main... Top, one of my main topics was actually um, choreography because okay. you're constantly being pushed and that's out of my comfort zone. I know these days. You I know, see. At the time, I didn't, but that was, I was constantly being pushed out of my comfort zone. Um, so in going a back good to way, Pilates but was... I think it was a bit like, a, it was a bit like a res respite. It was yes. like, oh, okay. Not that I would have put no. it that way in those, but no, you know, it was the constant now, that you were familiar with and you knew. Yeah. And yeah. it just gave me a sense of like, Ooh, I yeah. wasn't being pushed or, you know, like Perfect. it was, yeah. And so with it, I gave me a sense of stability and knowing to then feel more able when I was more pushed. I yeah. Guess, to a degree. Yeah. yeah. And so how did your career mm. build from there? So you're teaching Pilates, you're a dancer, any back pain, at that stage or had you pretty much worked your way through that i had no in when i was in london i had no back pain at all ever um because of what i'm going to say where i want to elaborate a little bit later on is um i do think our body has its own intellect um and intelligence and i know we share some thoughts there together um but again i couldn't i did not understand or respect that at the time you know, I was the boss and this is what my, how my body should behave. And I gave that and I looked at it as this other entity. And I have changed the word of the body being a vehicle. Um, and my time in Nepal through Buddhism and stuff, that was very much, you know, I see the purpose. But these days, it's a vessel that I inhabit. And for me, maybe it's because English isn't my um, first language. It's something very different. I care for my car. I'm super, like, every 10,000 Ks, like, mm. I am to the book. But I do not care if I need to get a car tomorrow, another car. It's, mm. it's just money valued, you know. It's, yeah. like, it's replaceable like that. I don't want that relationship with my body. Oh, I want to inhabit mm. this vessel, understand mm. its intelligence, and know that with my consciousness, that's how I'm going to make the most that's how I'm going to tap into my full potential yes yeah so for me that was at the time I definitely just saw it as a vehicle and I was the driver and I was in charge and you yeah. got to do as I tell you yeah so I had a ballet teacher that I um mentally really suffered under because she never saw any I know she meant really well but she only she only pointed out where we're where we're bad at um and I could hardly hold the ballet bar anymore I got such a bad gang and that was just my body going, you're not coping, you know. Within 24 hours of being away, um, having a break, it went away. Because I was really worried because I had to go and waitress to make money to survive. Yeah. For that, and during that school. And it went one down. Oh, my God, this is only stress-based. Mm. So that sort of, you know, I had a little bit of a glimpse into that. Mm. Long story short, I stopped dancing. I met an Aussie, fell in love. From one day to the other, I stopped doing anything. My body went into slight shock. No it, doubt. Would, it would. A year later, I decided to, you know, like, okay, I want to pursue my dance career. And, you know, maybe instead of trying to find a company straight away in Switzerland, um, I'll go into another school to see if I can, you know, through there you make your connections and stuff. So I went, just thought my body, you know, it's done it all the time. It'll be fine did a tiny bit of started running again, but really didn't train and just went hardcore into training again. And um, then I went mogul skiing and took the exact same, if you know what mogul skiing is, mm -hmm. I didn't swallow the mogul and took it up the same leg. Ow. And so I had that really Shock. strong sensation again, going, oh, okay, but again, you just get over it. The next day in class, I do have to say as well, I was really, really unhappy in that dance school. Every day I compared it to London and mm. Switzerland at the time was just so behind the eight ball. Mm. So it was not holistic. It was not the way the school was run. It was just not for, for me. And of course, it's wrong that I didn't just grab the opportunity. I just compared it constantly. I was really unhappy. Mm. But I could not admit that to myself, mm. let alone to anyone else, because I was the dancer. This was the thing that I identified with. Mm. So um, was it the mogul skiing only? Was it me being that unhappy? Like really unhappy. 
but I, I couldn't dare to fail or admit to myself that I'm that unhappy. Mm. So my back has always had my back. Yeah, I love it. My back always had my back. Ooh. And whenever I didn't listen, there's a that's t-shirt. When I had the most acute, mm. you know, back pain or mm. something coming up. And yes, there was a there was a there was a wear and tear there through that left side. It's the way that I always swung into my hip. Yes, it was the weaker side, you could say, in that sense, where I had less tensegrity within the joints. Um, however, it was my ticket out. Mm. And it was devastating. I went to rehab. I went back, forth and back. You know, long story short, I had to stop dancing so I wouldn't lose not feeling that leg. Yeah. And one doctor went, fine, we'll just inject you. And at 24, you might not feel your leg anymore, but at least you stood on stage. That's when I went, no way. This is too important. Yes. I want to feel my leg for the rest of my life. Yes. Despite if I stand on stage or not. Yeah. So I stopped. And then... Can you remember a sense of relief, though, in having that decision almost made for you? Yeah. 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 So there was, there was, there was this extreme... I remember going, this is the worst thing. At the same time, I felt an immense relief. Mm. And then I had this, I was like, in latest, in 10 years time, I will understand why this happened. Mm. I know right now I'm just devastated. I can't get it. Mm. But there's a reason and one day I will get it. Mm. And it's, you know, what, it's what you said from there. I had a list of what I should never do again. From there, I had an unexpected pregnancy. I rehabilitated myself through that. Um, so I improved. I was in chronic pain, but I still didn't get worse, which normally you would indicate that during pregnancy it gets worse and worse because you put so much stress on the body. Mm. So that in a way it gave me some um it gave me some trust within myself. Mm. And um so you know, from there within six months of um delivering our daughter i was a dance teacher again i skied again i snowboarded i went whitewater kayaking i did all the things that said i should never do and at the time i didn't realize that only a lot a lot later because i was very able at these things beforehand i looked very able to everyone else and it gave me confidence and i was able but i never pushed a line so I lost so much somatic trust. Mm. So um, even that's a beautiful word, somatic trust. I love it. That's that, just that, like I, I really see what you're saying, that it would be like a marathon runner is comfortable running 40Ks, but they only ever hold themselves to 10. And they're very capable at that 10, but they're not trusting. There's this whole vast, there's this whole, extra 20 30 k's of not knowing and they keep safe so you were moving but keeping safe mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. but that, that's that's not what we want in life really is it we no. don't <laughs> exactly but at the time it's like i and you know i do have to say something one of my favorite things in german is the word attitude and posture yes I've it's the same word it. yes so if I look, my attitude then was, well, this is what I'm able, you know, and in comparison to what they said I would be able again, I clearly proved them all wrong. Yeah. But I still just kept it in the ableness, if that is a thing that I was known, yes. that I knew. Yes. Rather than going, but, you know, maybe there, like you said, there, there is so much more if I would explore it, but mm. I didn't have that somatic trust. So I just, I kept it safe. And that mm. was also my attitude. And mm. if I look at pictures of my posture then, yeah, you know, it was, there was a reticence. Yeah. Or a, to a degree, a meekness. I'm not yes. saying that someone, but like deep within, I didn't get that. I didn't fully understand or I didn't yeah. inhabit myself fully. I didn't, yes. I also didn't sense myself fully through some through traumas. Yeah. So, so then it was, the second time where my back really, really, really played up again is when it was like, what are you going to do? Do you seriously want to just be, you know, so I did all these odd jobs as you do as a young mom of two kids and having moved country and stuff, you know, we just needed to stay afloat. Mm. And I did things that I was good at and I became the manager and this and that, but it was like, I was not happy. This mm. is not what I wanted to do long term. And, you know, there was, my back just didn't stop nudging me. Wow. I'm like, and every day I had to do something and I would do things to 
keep the discomfort at bay, but I wasn't discomfort free. Did you think, do you think even at that stage you knew what your buck was trying to do for you or was, were you labeling it, referring to it, thinking of it as just literally a pain in your butt that won't go away? Or did, was there a sense that no, okay, I had the hunch, I, I got the yeah, hunch. Yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. It was just a matter of timing and when you could, but it was grumbling enough to keep you mindful that this isn't where you wanted to be. Yeah. But it wasn't escalating in a dramatic sense that was forcing you to take action in a new direction yet. Yeah, it was just that constant, like you said, this constant reminder. And part of it was me taking that leap to mm. get out of my comfort zone. Because mm. these are the things that people were like, oh, you're really good at this. You know, I was in my comfort zone. Mm. Um, and um, so I did. I just went to the gym and, re you know, applied. Like being really scared but really hoping I get it. I didn't get it. Within a month I got a phone call. Okay. And they're like, oh, you know, and I applied the instructor is gone. Can you, you know, um, can you step in? And then I went, what have I done? But this seems to be my thing. I often get this confidence. I apply, I do something, and then I go when I like what, <laughs> and I have to learn to swim really fast. But getting back to your point, this this is you know it was after I um and I at twenty one at the time I thought it's about dance. I wrote down I want to be teaching teachers once. I want to be able to go so deep into the subject matter to teach lay people, but to also really teach teachers. Yeah. Um, and of course I would have never thought that's how it is going to develop because at the time I thought it would be in the dance world um, but this is where I am at these days mm. so tell us where you're at these days so I teach for Art Motion um, Academy which is a contemporary Pilates school but also Karin Gordner who's the one of the co-founders she wrote or developed Slings My Fascial Training and this is really the this was the biggest turning point in my life, in my career, is as soon as I became, I went back to teaching Pilates, um, I started training with her in Perth. She's Swiss, but we never met in Switzerland, even though we lived in the same city for quite a few years. And um, also through the contemporary Pilates. So what you said before about Pilates, I agree, but she gave me such a different spin on everything. Yeah. It and, was and like, look at everyone, look at the body, look at the psychosomatic person behind it and then even when you teach a group class you still have that in the back of your mind that it is you know the way you feel this morning is going to have an effect the way that we train mm. or our attitude towards our body or our you know or our training on that day mm. and and I, I think the method or I've seen you teach and it's not it's not what I would see taught in 80 to 90 percent of life these classes I, I don't know if the industry has evolved much since I was teaching within it but um certainly I wouldn't it, you, seeing you teach and seeing the slings approach made me realize like anything Pilates is not Pilates wherever you go it's going to be taught differently it's going to be taught by teachers with varying degrees of knowledge um it's going to be taught really badly some places and it's going to be taught exceptionally well some places so I think what I would just say, being mindful of the listener in back pain, thinking about Pilates, I always stress, do your research, really know where you're going and to, just don't rock up to any old place and jump in and think that what you're, that's, that Pilates is your best opportunity. It, it actually may damage you um, or it may be the best thing that you ever learn about your body, but don't judge one experience with Pilates and cast it across all experiences with Pilates because it is very independent of where you go and who you see and even what stage of the injury you're in really that's my vibe yeah I think it goes with anything it does you know, Pilates has a bad names here yoga has a bad names there this and that and for other people it's been a game changer like you said exactly, I think it's yeah. very much for me personally sometimes it's maybe also and you know at the beginning um it was like, but this is what it was taught and that's how it has to be. And then Carlin really, she started to go, but you're allowed to question, you know, like Joseph Pilates was so far ahead of his time. Mm. But at the time it was thought that the spine is straight. Mm. You know? But even Clara, his wife, apparently, he used to train the fit 
boxes and like he was rigid and hard and and full on Mm. but I think it was actually Clara who his wife who made a lot of the adaptations on his original moves because she was the one who recognized that well that's great Joe but 90% of the people coming here can't do any of these movements there needs to be scaled down progression so um yeah and and Corinne is scaling and bringing her own influence to them as well yeah and I think that for me that was a turning point I um I you know, I think otherwise I probably wouldn't be teaching anymore. Yeah. Um, and then obviously slings, which is only like, you know, in the last six, in the, in the last 10 years, but really deeply um, in the last seven, six years of understanding more the architecture of fascia and the um, fascial and muscular collaboration. And by learning more about that and then understanding it within myself of what it means to create more tensile strength mm. for myself mm. um, has changed everything. When I was teaching in Russia last year or the year before, they were like, but don't you want to be 20 again? I was like, um, no, thanks. <laughs> no way. And then I was like, you know, what I'm able to do now, like I don't train the splits anymore, so I can't do the splits. I'm sure if I would train for it, I could, but mm. If I had that tensile strength and that dynamic stability and the way that um, my skeleton is balanced due to the myofascial balance, oh, my God, it would be a different world. Mm. You know, like there's, I have so much ease and freedom. Mm. And more than you had in your younger days. Oh, my God. Exactly. and So, so much more. So you're older, but you're moving better than you were even and you were a really capable mover in your 20s but your movement quality now is superior to that despite all these things that so that apparently happen to us as we get older apparently our bones get more brittle apparently we get weaker apparently you know it goes on those are nice they are the natural tracking of our body with age but only natural because most people stop stimulating all those parts of their body if people could understand that stimulating a body will always create an output in it and if we if we notice something declining if we simply stimulate it more the body can adapt and respond to that stimulus and therefore we can overcome a lot of the so-called things that happen with aging and i think you know what you're touching on is like let's take um fascial architecture for for example like one of it um, one of the things is it's multi-directional mm. but you know um if you don't move it in that way, like, you know, how does the sentence go? Um, not train it or lose it, but like, if you don't- If um, you don't move it, you lose it. Exactly. So if you don't train in that way, you will lose yeah. that multi-direction. Of course, it's, you can't just go, well, it's innately like that by design. Yes, it is. <laughs> but form follows function, yes. literally. So yes. if you do not train or utilize it in that way you will change the form therefore the function yeah yeah and so like um you know understanding these predispositions that we have but then how to intentionally train them through movement yes is really what it's it's changed everything like i'm not i'm excited to go like you know whatever the next 10 years gonna bring exactly because i've seen i've seen other people just going up yeah well the more we learn about a body the more we learn how to manipulate a body and manipulation sounds like a strong word but we could you know we could encourage it to respond in new ways which is a lovely idea and it all comes back to knowledge doesn't it knowledge of the system and the structure and how how it operates and i think we're learning so much more about the brain and the fascial system and all these emotional bodies and all these other things that when we bring all that knowledge together, it, it means that um, we can see the body more as beyond what you were saying as a vehicle. But, you know, I love, I love this idea of embodying mm. this gift that we have, which is our body and building a relationship with it. And pain is always that invitation to look at that relationship. Do you think yeah. it's that simple? 
I do like, I mean, I really love Gabo Mate's work. Mm. Um, so like some of, and I, you know, I mean, scratch the surface of it, but I do, I've always, even, even at 20 already, I was always interested in the psychosomatic. Mm. And I did, you know, sometimes I didn't fully dare to look at it because I had an association of wanting to be a dancer. So yes. I needed to like get a slap in my face. Yeah. And I'm to this day so very grateful to an osteopath in this town who said at one point, stop coming to me you have all the tools in your tool belt stop looking for others to fix you and tap into your resources he said it a little bit different but it was like he slapped me in the face and it meant what do you mean i have to take ownership because i was in victimhood were you you were yeah i know no one saw it and i didn't again it's this thing i didn't want to tell myself wow i didn't see it at the time no no but in hindsight it's like well to a degree i wanted to i was strong i put this in and you know i did but there was also sometimes this excuse of like you know so i it was it was a poker card yeah that sometimes i did play gotcha you'd pull it out when it suited you absolutely (laughs) not knowingly and when I had that aha, like yeah. it was like that slap in the face going yeah. like, shit, I have to own this. Yeah, wow. And that's also when I realized I was babysitting my clients I, because mm. I so dearly didn't mm. want them to go through what I went through. Mm. But I made them enable to move without me with mm. every little bit that I was helping yes. them rather yes. than empowering them and going, I can't fix you. I can never fix anyone. No. I can be the coach on your sideline. I can be yeah. your, your, you know, I can cheer you on i can Mm. give you all the tools but i can only give you the tools and with my help Mm. you apply them Mm. but you have to want to own this Mm. and to also not then the next step is of not being judgmental if they don't want to Mm. yeah and so you know i think like um it took a lot for me to go and step back and go, I'm not, I know that my intention was empowering them, but I was babysitting them. I wasn't, I was enabling their power. And now yeah. the biggest thing is just how can I empower them? Well, as you're saying that, I'm thinking it's beyond the movement method. What we're really teaching are movement philosophies. We're teaching people how to approach whatever movement they choose to do. And, it, and that's based on basic rules. You know, for me, it's the philosophy of Feldenkrais. You know, if it hurts, find a new way. Acknowledge that it hurts. You know, explore it, why it might be hurting, but ultimately skirt your way around it and find a new way to sequence that movement. Um, but, but so those philosophies, therefore, uh, my biggest pet peeve is someone saying, should I do it this way? Am, am I allowed to do this? Uh, do you think it's okay if I go for a walk? You know, and, and I have said this multiple times. I don't know. Ask your body. It'll tell you. you know, like, but when I start hearing questions, too many questions like that from a patient, I'm mindful. Man, I'm creating. Am I creating? This is the opposite of what I'm trying to create in this person. I want them to have the confidence to answer these questions for themselves. And, you know, that's just another conversation, isn't it? But I, I, think, I think certain movement practices, this is a very specific about how things done lead a little bit to a person not having confidence that anything they do is right in their bodies. And that, that I think Pilates, can, the wrong Pilates teacher can be guilty of. I think they can put, they can put that into someone's system so that, you know, I get people in here all the time. Oh, I have been told to tuck my tailbone under my, my lordosis is too big, or I've been told I need to turn my knees this way, or I've been told I, you know, and so they, this body before me is just stamped with compensations, learned behaviours that it's almost like then we have to go through and unfreeze everything and let it melt and let it find new ways of being. It's not so rigid and structured. And that's been going on since, you know, a child in school being told to stand tall and pull your shoulders back. You know, we, we have so many learned behaviours about basic posturing which don't help us. You know, you would see that as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think that um, uh, two things. One of my absolute favorite um, things that, so Carlin has derived like 12 fascial movement qualities. And um, if you're interested in that, um, there's a book that he's written. You can get it on Amazon. It's Slings Essentials. It's amazing if this is where you want to go. I'll put that, I, I've seen the cover. I haven't read it. Yeah. I'll put that in the show notes. But um the the last one is kinesthetic intelligence so the first thing that that you were talking about is um 
sometimes I think we live in a very disembodied world. There's, there's a big movement. There's so many people these days who are pushing for an embodied, but it's, yes. like, you know, it's what you, yeah, it's things that we're, we're taught even in school sitting so long still. And, you know, there's so many things that we have to fit into to be accepted in our society. Mm. Um, so, um, so kinesthetic intelligence is, you know, proprioceptive finesse, which I, when I was, um, teaching Pilates when I learned Pilates at the beginning I didn't have proprioceptive finesse it was like the pelvic floor goes on to a 10 or the abdominals go on to a 10 it wasn't like it's a two it's a three it's a four am I bracing am I bracing because I'm actually scared I'm going to hurt my back is it based on reality or is it based on something yeah so um so you know how do we coordinate movement how much do we need to engage when in extremely simple terms as you know, this goes further, but this, like, it's, this is like <laughs> I, super simple I know. terms. We've got to simplify and keep it uh, simple for the person listening who, I mean, there's lots of teachers that are hopefully are listening to this movement therapist as well. But um, for that person in back pain and they're thinking about three steps forward from here. Yeah, so when you're moving to sometimes go, you're picking up a tissue from the floor. Do you need to brace your back? Hopefully not, but how often I went always into bracing when it wasn't necessary. Yeah. Because back in the very back, there was this, oh my God, this back pain is going to attack me again. Yeah. So I had to sensitize myself. Mm. So this goes then into, um, into interception. And that's like interceptive clarity. So you have a sensation and then you have an emotional reaction. But for a moment, can you observe and become aware of your sensation? Because most of the time we just, you know, it just blurs. Can you become aware of the sensation? Hmm, this is a different sense in my back. I haven't done this for a long time. Marion or Mumu has brought me into this movement. Or is it that the emotion, they're really good, don't get me wrong, I'm all for emotions, but the, the memory is the emotion hijacks and just goes, oh, high alert. This is bad. bad. Yeah. yeah. So then the interceptive sense mm. is so, it's too sensitized. Mm. So it goes on overload yeah. in that sense of, of, you know, sensitivity. So then yeah. changing that threshold. So just going back to, there's a lot more to it. We don't have time to go into that, but no. one day we will. It's more like when you're in back pain um, to sometimes, if you can, for a moment, you Pause and you go okay this is a sensation now if i just stay with the sensation for a moment is it actually alarming yes it's painful yes it's sharp yes it's okay or it's like no i just haven't sensed this my back hasn't moved like this for so long so it's a very different sensation but it's actually not unsafe or you know i'm on the floor mm. so to be able to become an observer for a moment yes so therefore she called it interceptive clarity because you can be aware that you're angry let's say a different thing that you're angry but you're just going to react yeah yeah rather than going you're clear that you're angry and you're going to observe it before you do something mm. yeah so you're saying bring that to movement and particularly um painful movements pause become aware and question the senses and even that even that pause and awareness and questioning will give you power because mm -hmm. you can then say am i reacting from default fear you know am i hijacking and tensing because i fear something's going to happen has something bad actually happened or is it my anticipated fear response that's creating the tension that creates then it's a self-perpetuating cycle isn't it that's great i like that so pause and observe and become aware of the sensations mm -hmm. yeah good and then the other person who's the pusher because you have those two yeah that are a numb or just no pain no gain we've all yeah. most of us who are listening to this have grown up in this yeah no pain no gain so yeah. then there you might have to go is there still ease is there you know still are ease? you are you range of motion and ease or like pushing range of motion or where you actually have the movement ability today 
are two very different things. Mm. So then for the ones that are, you know, like, no, but I need to, and it needs to hurt or just, there's a very fine line for those people. They also have to get interceptive clarity mm. or proprioceptive finesse. So to really train that kinesthetic intelligence, are you always, you know, pushing can you go oh you know what i only have ease to hear and right now this is your scope it doesn't mean it's not going to change mm. but it's it's what you um to just push against what you said before someone says to you you have collapsed arches so you superimpose that you have arches yeah then you're you're going against it's like making the knot in the shoe in the shoelace even more tight yeah rather than for a moment going maybe we need to go into this pattern mm. soften into it and then come out of it by creating integrity enough stability enough mm. tensile strength or whatever it needs yeah what it what it is needed there yeah. yeah to create more balance but i think one of the the biggest words for me became as well is is ease because with ease then there's also joy if you have ease in your movement you have more movement joy that creates more movement love that creates more somatic trust and the jackpot of all things <laughs> is somatic trust i love it once i realized i can i can yeah i'm gonna go and help my husband put roof sheets on you know like i this this movement if i need to push no problem overhead movement's not easy for me yeah i really do not train it but to know I trust myself that I will not, my back will not be painful afterwards. Mm. Like, but to even trust myself even, to lift something at a weird angle. Yeah. I have lost somatic trust. I yeah. did it because we had to move, but I yeah. always paid for it. Yeah. But I don't anymore. So what I want people to understand is that these terms that you're throwing out here, they're not common language in the industry of back pain. Mm. What is common is activate your core, fire up your glutes, stretch out your piriformis, lengthen your hamstrings. What I want to see is all that chucked down and these newer terms brought to the table. Movement is, what's your interceptive clarity like? What's your mindful awareness of how you're moving like? That, that's the shift that we need to bring if we're going to have more and more people move in the direction of healing with their backs. And, you know, that's what these conversations are about. And the reason you are so good at what you do is because you're using this language, but we need to make this language more commonplace. And it is through discussions like this that people listening hopefully go, wow, I thought getting my back stronger was about uh, doing, you know, six pack abdominal movements and laying, that, that's the common myth or the common myth about back pain. And there's an evolution going on within the teaching community. We're starting to understand these terms and embrace them and feel the benefits of them in our own bodies. And what I want is for people in pain to be exposed to this quicker, sooner, earlier, rather than waiting mm -hmm. 10 years to find some look across who has this knowledge. And they just, they hit the jackpot because they're guided out of what they're in because they found one person who knew stuff that many others didn't. And yeah, so we're chatting with the intention of raising awareness for more and more people that to find a way through back pain, the, the reason maybe you haven't already is because you haven't had access to these ways of thinking and hopefully you can start to track them down more. And on that, where can people find more about you? So in the show notes will be my Facebook um, page where I don't have a website these days um, because I'm linked to too many schools um, <laughs> like Art Motion Academy and Anatomy Trains Australia and New Zealand. So you can always look them up as well. Um, now, there are some really good movement videos yeah, that you're involved in. Yeah, exactly. We so will... on the websites, of there will be in the show notes as well. Good. And then there is a little link to a free small video that's shared on my Facebook page um, that Marin will just share in case you want to, you know, explore that a little bit. Um, I did during during COVID because I really used um, slings, my fascia training at the time, even though I trained it on the mat and of course I did the physical training, but knowing that it will give me mental um, 
stamina and that I can tap into my resourcefulness. Because when it first happened and I was in Europe, um, you know, there was a, there was a panic. There was, um, there was scarcity. At least that's what I found. There was a lot of scarcity around as well. Um, so I really used my training on the mat to instill calm groundedness and i knew that if i feel strong centered and balanced within myself that that has a ripple effect on all my emotions so what you said before what was my actual point i wanted to get to is the more we can feel then we can listen i couldn't listen i could coordinate movement very well but i held the trauma that i was numb i was numb for years mm. and yes I could coordinate movement. Therefore, I felt very able. And um, it was my husband that said, your body language doesn't match your, your verbal language. And I was arrogant and I was young and I went, get yourself a freaking handbook on Mumu's body language. That was my exact comeback. I know, I, I shot at myself. Um, he was on it. Body language doesn't, it doesn't lie. But I did, at the time, I relied on how other people reacted to verbally express myself because I didn't feel myself enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever that is, it doesn't have to be intense trauma, but many of us, it could be constant stress that you've, you've gone on numb. So, or if you're, you know, if you're in, in, in the sympathetic nervous system, you're not interested in sensing, unfortunately, but with it, you miss what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. This amazing intellect, your gut brain heart communication intuition that informs mm. us and then from there we make a decision is this good should i go running today mm. no today i shouldn't mm. but if you know you being an athlete me being a dancer sometimes we just overrode it with that drive mm. and these days it's like no mm. today i make a decision because it's going to be better for my physical and mental health yes. or today i really need to move even though i don't feel it i don't feel like it it's going to have such an impact mm. and it's getting to know when and when to caution all those things but i think if we're in pain what 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 you're describing about is the end game with movement as a way to live life isn't it it brings so much to our life experience and this back pain that whatever someone might be sitting in right now could be the ex well i i always assume it is exactly how it needs to be right now for you to shift something take that first step and begin a journey of movement confidence which then grows to feeling strong which then grows to feeling empowered in your life which then goes into performance and joy and pleasure and fully like you said at the start fully owning this thing called our body this beautiful gift that is a body which makes our life experience ultimately 10 times better so from where you are now to where you can be is huge and, it, and it's a pathway and it's been traveled by many mm. and uh again the idea of having the chats is that those that have been on that journey have learned what they've learned are now teaching it invariably to others and helping them learn and grow along the way so um thank you for coming on thanks for the time we've probably thank you so much. exceeded our whatever we proposed or set out to do but who cares one final question building a bulletproof back or a bulletproof back what does that mean for you what is that what, is, what comes to mind when i say that what does it look like in your mind's eye adequate fascial tension <laughs> coupled with the right dynamic dynamic stability so strong flexible muscles and movement ease movement ease great good all right summed it up brilliant we're going to put all those little tidbits in the show notes and uh i really encourage you one of the safest most quality ways to start to learn pilates if that's what you choose would be through mumu's crew they um they brought together a way of moving that really encompasses more than just the mechanical motion it brings in the embodiment it brings in the balancing of the fascial lines uh it's it's a beautiful movement discipline all of its own so go and have a little sample of one of their videos and see if it's something that resonates with you and you might want to pursue more
Great. All right. Well, we're going to be over and out and uh, get on with our days. Thanks for listening.